Hello. Welcome to Archival Adventures. I hope that everything is set up and working correctly. Um, as always, the technical setup for this stream is always in flux. Um, that camera, when we switch over to the documents, I might have to get up and adjust it a little bit. We'll see. Um, uh, the top, uh, like, I don't have the document camera anymore. Instead, I have a camcorder uh, pointed down at the table. So fingers crossed that all of that works. Uh, <laughs> but hello and welcome everybody. Um, let me make sure that I can see both channels. Yes, I can. Uh, hello, Lord Portico. Hello, Shadows of Life. Hello, Key Squared. Hi, was not worth it. Um, it is exceedingly warm and humid here today. It is actively storming outside. Um, so if by chance uh, the storm intensifies and you hear some thunder and lightning, <laughs> then you know what's going on. Um, also, y you may hear a bit of, um, of fan noise because it's really warm and humid today. And so even though this room is now air conditioned on a regular basis, um, I am needing the fan. <laughs> Uh, yes, warm, humid, and storming. Um, I mean, it is, uh, th this place is affectionately known as Bleaksburg for a reason. Um, let me go ahead and start, though, um, as we typically do for this stream, uh, with reading the Land and Labor Acknowledgement from Virginia Tech. Um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands both locally and in western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were pro prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to utprosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So, thank you for, uh... <laughs> Bearing with me for one second. I'm trying to make sure... So, I have a number of things in store for you today. And I'm trying to make sure that all of my technology is um, up to date with everything that I'm doing. Um, that one does not want to do what I need it to do. Uh, so I, I need my phone to be able to show me the chat because I'm gonna lose uh, the chat on this screen at points during today because I have uh, videos to share in today's collection, as well as um, large format items, which is part of why the camera above me got put in um, and actually activated uh, for today's stream. So uh, hopefully you're ready. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it's just always uh, rainy here. Um, and during the summer, that means hot. So uh, it is not the greatest of weather conditions, but you know, whatever. Um, today, we are looking at a collection that is titled the Los Angeles Poverty Department, LAPD Collection. Um, the finding aid for which you should uh, have a link to in chat very shortly, um, I think. There it is. Um, and let me tell you uh, a little bit in case you're not in a place where you can actually pull up that finding aid. Um, 
So what I know about this collection going in, uh, again, as with most things on this show, I have not taken a look through the materials. I don't really know what's there. Um, this one I did a little preliminary work to look at some of the uh, audio and video recordings and see if there was stuff that I wanted to digitize to be able to share on stream because I managed to find time for that. So I have three video clips. Um, but uh, let's see, the historical note here, the Los Angeles Poverty Department is a theater and community activism group made up of artists, residents, and people who work on Skid Row in Los Angeles, dedicated to creating change and sharing stories. The group began in 1985 and remains active within the community and performs throughout the world. More information about the group and its mission is available on the Los Angeles Poverty Department website, uh, which is lapovertydepartment.org, uh, sorry, lapovertydept.org. Um, I can, uh, if Portico hasn't beat me to it, I can drop that link in the chat. Uh, and I can also drop it over here. Possibly. Oh. I have a quick and easy way to do that. Doing things on two different computers, I can't copy and paste from one computer to the other. Uh, so it slows me down on a little, uh, a couple of these things. So um, given that description for this collection, the natural question to ask is, why is it at Virginia Tech? And I assure you, I have the same question because I don't actually have an answer for that beyond that it is noted in um, our materials that it was a gift. It does not tell me who donated it to our archives, which is not terribly surprising. Um, it may be surprising to find out that an archives at a Research One institution does not have perfect records about um, everything that's in its collection and how they got here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to read the scope and content note real quick. Uh, the collection includes papers, photographs, and audio materials from the Los Angeles Poverty Department. Um, from the time of that organization's founding in 1985 until about 2000. It's organized into two series, uh, papers and photographs and audio, which is um, noted on here as cassettes and reels, but that also included VHS tapes, um, which had video, as I discovered. Um, so, as always, you're welcome to look at the listing of things that, um, when you get to the container list and you can see like the folder titles, if you see something listed there that you would like me to make sure I pull out for stream and we take a look at, let me know. Otherwise, I am going to pull out boxes and we'll take a look and see what's inside of them um, and sort of discover what's here in this collection together. Um, glancing through like box one and box two, I think there are a number of like grant applications and things like that. We probably won't spend much time on those um, unless you're really interested in that. Otherwise, I'm going to focus on more graphical materials like um, performance flyers or if there's like scripts or things like that. I'm going to look for those types of things because I think they make for a better experience on stream. But if you really want me to dig into like the actual like documentation of how they did their work, um, applying for grant funds, what those applications looked like. I am happy to dive into that stuff uh, because a lot of times it's going to give us some insight into like, who is this organization? What is their stated mission? What is their stated purpose? Uh, what was their mission and purpose back in 1985? Is that different from what's on their website today? I don't know. Um, I do know that they do have a website. It is active. You can visit it. Uh, that is that link that I dropped in chat. Um, and they also have a Twitter account, <laughs> which I, uh, I 
tagged their Twitter in the tweets announcing today's stream. I have no idea if anybody from the organization will pop up in chat. I suppose it's possible. Um, and maybe they'll know why their materials are here, because I don't. Um, I know that at some point in time, uh, a large number of materials were added to our collections, and um, there was a point in time, a period of time, where uh, our archives was actively working to collect uh, theater-related collections. Um, and then at some point, a bunch of that stuff got put into a room in this building uh, to wait for it to be processed, organized, etc. And I don't know who put it there. I don't know how long it was there. But most of the stuff in that room, the documentation of how we came to acquire it um, at some later date went missing. So um, one of my coworkers prior to my time here uh, actually took on the challenge and got everything out of that room, identified it, um, created records for it, got it into the processing pipeline so that things were organized and described and actually made available to the public. But a lot of that is, we might have an idea of when we got it, but we don't know necessarily where it came from. And I suspect that this is probably one of those collections where we know it was sometime around like 2001. We know it was a gift. We don't know who gave it to us or why. Um, so yeah, <laughs> clearly it was aliens. Right, right. Um, okay, uh, box one, folder 19, cold, wet weather festivals. Box one, folder two, uh, or possibly, I'm not sure if that's box. I'll have to look at the finding aid on that one, but, um, NEA Theater 80 or 98.99 and Lollapalooza 98.99. Um, we can definitely make those happen. Um, so uh, I guess that's starting us with box one. Let me go ahead and uh, cold wet weather would be a rarity to celebrate in LA. Well, so that's the thing. They perform all over the world. So that folder might not have anything to do with LA. But we'll find out. That's kind of why this is an exploration. Um, I'm going to switch us to the document view. And um, hopefully, if I have to get up and adjust cameras, literally, after I clicked go live, after I started the stream, um, I stood up and I hit my head on the camera. And that moved the camera. And so I'm not sure that the camera is aligned where it was before. So I tried to adjust things around, but with the stream already live, I couldn't switch to a live feed to see, because I don't have a live monitor once the stream is live. So I might have to do a little bit of uh, just camera adjustments from having hit my head on the brand new camera that I'm not used to having where it is. Uh, we'll see. Um, okay. <laughs> so right now it is zoomed out. You can see the two computers that I'm using to run the stream. Um, and I think we're good. Uh, height seems good. I, it's not like chopping off the top of my head. Um, you can see this table that I don't normally have. I'm just going to slide it out of frame um, so that the green screen does its job. Also, the green screen is a little bit more of a grainy outline now than normal, but that's because it is literally, um, like, I'm not a good judge of distance. It's like six feet behind me instead of like right behind me like it normally is um, because we only have one um, mounting bar in the room and it's in the center of the room. So in order to be under the top down camera, I had to move to the center of the room. It's, it's fine. It's all just new technology and um, adjusting how the stream is set up in response. Um, it's trying to show the wood grain behind me. Yes, literally grainy. 
You think we're, that you're the... Um, indeed, you are the computer on the right. Uh, and you can even see my phone with the, the chat on it for when... Um, I'm actually going to fix this because I don't need to be this zoomed out yet. Um, in fact, I don't know how I zoomed out that far because I wasn't zoomed out that far. But um, now you can see lovely top-down camera. I have an entire archival box. And you can see top-down into the archival box with me, um, which the prior camera could not do. I'm a little excited about this. I have been asking for this since before the first episode. And literally this camera and the, the bar to hang it from and most of this setup has been, um, the orders were placed more than a year ago uh, and we're finally getting them. So yeah, chatception. Um, okay. The only thing I wish that I had, so this camera, um, there is a remote control that can be used to control uh, its zoom level and things like that. Um, what we didn't know uh, when we were planning for it and, and uh, what I don't know if we will ever get. So uh, right now I'm using a, a website, like a web page, um, to control the camera zoom. The remote control is uh, like $1,600 remote control in order to do this. I think that it would be useful for, like, that it would be a good investment and is, it was planned as a part of the setup, um, but I have no idea whether we'll actually, uh, actually spend the money to get that. Uh, um, we did not realize that the remote control was sold separately and very expensive. So, you know, we'll discover as we go along. Um, also, I need to make sure before I lose it that I um, copy Shadows of Life, your post, so that I know um, without having to scroll really, really far back uh, what it is that I'm trying to make sure that I get to for you. Um, so this is box one, and you had asked for box one, folder 19, cold, wet weather festivals. Uh, you have it, thank you, Portico. I also copied it out, but um, thank you very much uh, for making sure you have that for me. Um, also, hi, Crafty Becky, I see you there. Um, so this is the inside of an archival box, which I have not really been able to show you before. Um, and so you can see all the little folders here. You can see even in this one the, um, the little organizer tabs that uh, were used in C2, like uh, that, that were used by the people who created these documents um, to organize it for themselves. Uh, and those have been maintained in here because there was really no reason to get rid of them. Um, it's not like they're rusty metal or something like that. Uh, so let me find folder 19 here. Cold, wet weather festivals. Folders one and two. This is a very strange sort of way to describe it or to do it. Because um, what they're actually saying is that there are two folders. And so it's just folder 19 and folder 20, but for some reason they chose to say folders one and two, um, which is just confusing. Uh, I think a parent parenthetical saying like um, two folders and uh, listing it as folders 19 and 20 would be clearer. Um, but, oh, oh, I get what they're saying now. Looking at the finding aid, I see it. It's, it's folder one of two and folder two of two. Um, also, what am I grabbing that is pulling out folder 21? There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm excited about the new setup. And so I'm also trying not to like, I have two tables together here. I'm trying not to push one of them out of the way as I shove that box aside. Anywho, close to making an archival, archival adventure symposium. 
So we have cold, wet weather festivals. Uh, <clears throat> folder one of two and folder two of two. And I'm gonna go ahead and try zooming in even further. Um, look at that. It's so lovely because it's a camcorder so it maintains focus as it zooms in, um, which the old document camera I was using before didn't really do that. But also now I can give you like a full uh, eight and a half by 11 size view. You can see the whole document and then I can zoom in even further if we want to like focus on a certain section of it. It's just so lovely to have um, the upgraded technology and I want to say thank you so, so much. So very, very much to um, Jonathan for uh, <laughs> making sure that this equipment got ordered and for Alice really for getting it all set up, helping me. Uh, we met yesterday so that we could test out everything and make sure that it all worked. I'm gonna look, focus on the um, actual like documents now though. Uh, so, what we have to start, cold slash wet 94, LA Fest 93, cold slash wet 93, uh, that is what is in the first of these two folders, according to the tabs. <laughs> we start with a fax cover sheet. Um, I'm, I didn't know I was going to have fax numbers on screen right away. Uh, also. Thankfully, these are like more than 20 years old and hopefully the phone numbers are no longer active anymore. Uh, but I have no way of knowing. Los Angeles Poverty Department. Um, this is to the Cultural Affairs Department in Los Angeles, California, an invoice for services to theater workshops on January 29th and 31st of 1994 at homeless shelters. Um, not terribly surprising what I was able to learn about the organization um, from their website, or at least what I gathered from looking at their website very briefly, um, was that uh, they do, because of their geographic connection to Skid Row in Los Angeles, um, and um, their mission, um, not only do they perform for homeless people, but they also, a lot of the performers themselves um, are homeless or have been homeless. So um, that's just something to expect with this collection. Uh, so they were charging $500 to the Cultural Affairs Department of Los Angeles for these two performances. Um, okay. We appear to have multiple copies of this invoice. I'm not sure why. Um, invoice number two, April 18, 1994. Services rendered producing seven workshops. January 22nd, 24th, and 29th, and February 12th, 18th, 19th, and 21st of 1994 as part of the City of Los Angeles' cold slash wet weather shelter program of the Community Development Department. So now we have a little bit more clarification of what specifically cold slash wet weather means in the context of these records. Um, which for the people that were actually doing this and creating these records, um, the shorthand of cold slash wet weather told them exactly what event it was or what program it was part of. Uh, for us, we didn't have that context. Now we do, we know that this is, um, performances or workshops that were related to the cold or wet weather shelter program uh, that Los Angeles had at the time. I have no idea um, what the city of Los Angeles has in place now for cold or wet weather shelter uh, programming. Um, so it looks like a total of $1,750 that they charged for that uh, series of seven workshops. Um, and, and this is an invoice, so we don't know more. Uh, it'd be lovely to know kind of what was done in those workshops, what the focus of them was, but that doesn't normally go on an invoice, so not really something that you would expect to find here. Um, 
A listing for prize money. Yes. Um, it looks like they had $25 that they gave away as prize money for something uh, related. So they had a, uh, $350 um, to pay the director, uh, $500 to pay the performers, um, $650 in administrative costs, which would have paid uh, whatever administrative staffing or possibly production. Nope, nope, production's a separate. So um, the bookkeeping, uh, other things like that, I presume. Um, I'm guessing that's mostly money that went to people that were doing administrative work for them. $145 total in transportation costs, $25 for prize money, uh, which I assume was for prizes that were given away as part of the program, and then $108 for production materials. Um, and I'm, I am noticing now uh, I probably need better lighting for the documents themselves um, because as I move my hands around, which I tend to do, we're getting shadows on the documents. Mental note for, um, you know, figuring out in the future. Um, then we have some lovely handwritten notes. Um, we've got Saturday, January 22nd, a note of no show. So I don't know if that means just there were no attendees or they had to cancel for some reason. Um, January 24th, 140 people. January 29th, 85 people. I presume this is 94, and uh, as we move further down, we see, indeed, 1994. Um, the people involved, we just know Larry, Sunshine, uh, Wayne, and Pat um, were involved in this. If I was more familiar with the organization or researching their history, I could probably figure out exactly who those people are. Um, the numbers don't add up. All right, so we've got 650 and 350, so that's 1,000. Uh, we've got 1,500 just from the first three, 1,645, 1,670 plus 100 would be 1,770. Yeah, uh, the total of the line items is 1778 and the total amount due is 1750. So I don't know why the discrepancy um, because yeah, the the total itemized is $1,778. Um, I, I have no idea what the accounting policy would have been uh, for a lot of places that deal with a lot of invoices. Um, it can be go ahead and pay it if it's if the itemized doesn't match as long as the total is less than what the itemized is. But also for a lot of organizations, that would be reason to reject this invoice and re request a corrected one um, because the numbers don't match. I have no idea. I would presume that the city government of LA would have asked for a corrected invoice that correctly itemized things, um, but no idea. Yeah, I don't know whether I, that would be something, if I was looking into this and trying to find out who these people were, I would be curious as to whether Sunshine was um, a given name or a nickname. Uh, but honestly, it would not surprise me if Sunshine was a given name. Um, that is, would not be unusual, terribly. Um, and, the, and so we have one here, February 18th, where it says bust. They've stopped listing the um, number of attendees. Uh, it, it says bust over here, and it says workshop didn't happen. Uh, so they are charging for a series of seven workshops, but it seems like possibly the first one had no attendees, and the one on the 18th never happened. Um, so... I don't know. Uh, let's see. Social service coordination monthly report. Uh, 
I can zoom out a little bit so that you can get a better view. So for the month of February, we have new image emergency, February 12th. Uh, four staff or volunteers, 270 clients served, um, and it was a talent show. Uh, Tiny Town number one, Vermont, February 18th, two staff or volunteers, 77 clients, talent show. Tiny Town number two, Western, though, is the next day with four staff or volunteers uh, serving 86 people, and it's listed as a performance rather than a talent show. And then Panama Hotel, February 21st, five people, 60 approximate uh, people served, and a performance. Um... January, this one. So do you know what happened to this, uh, this piece of paper? Does anybody have um, theories as to why this paper looks like this? Um, this is the 1993-94 cold slash wet weather homeless shelter program. Um, Social service coordination monthly report. Uh, we have fame assistance, number one with four um, staff and the workshop was canceled because Peggy Hill did not know about it. I don't know who Peggy Hill was, uh, but apparently they couldn't do the workshop without her knowing about it. Um, fame assistance number two, Rakestraw Memorial Center, four staff, 140 people served, with a performance and talent show for all clients. And then the Lutheran Social Service on January 29th with three staff serving 85 people, uh, performance and talent show for all clients. Um, yeah, Crafty Becky, that's... Uh, it, it does look to me like it has been sun bleached. I don't think it has, though. It may have been. But the paper itself... Um, so you, you don't have this to help you out. This is regular copier paper, like regular, just plain white paper that is used in printers and copy machines all over today. This is not. This is, um, to the touch, it's much more slick. I have a feeling, like this feels more like receipt paper um, I don't know the exact, exact thing that it would have been intended for um, in this sort of size, but uh, if you're familiar with like modern receipt paper, it's um, heat sensitive. <clears throat> and so like if you, if you have a, like a receipt from a store or something and you let it sit in your car, it will be completely illegible because it gets exposed to heat. Even if it's not exposed to sunlight, the heat in the car will activate the whole page. <clears throat> this is um, heat sensitive paper, um, similar to that. And so I have a feeling in some way, the outer portion of this got sort of exposed to additional heat. And that totally could have been from exposure to sunlight, um, but it is definitely a heat reaction. Let's see. Just trying to see what we have, see what else we can find in here. Oh, gosh. Uh, so notes from uh, one of these performances. It, this is undated, but we might be able to at least surmise which performance it was. Um, so this is saying, uh, to pay Sunshine, pay Larry, uh, don't pay Pat, uncertain why. Possibly Pat wasn't there. Um, arrived at shelter at 7.10 p.m., and the person in charge 
did not know anything about us. Every, everybody was sleeping, according to Peggy, the shelter manager. She asked to postpone the show. So now we know who Peggy was. She was the shelter manager, and everybody was asleep. So they uh, canceled and rescheduled the show. Um, so these are the little notes of the people who were on site that we've already seen that translated into those reports. Um, I'm not going to, because there's so much more in this collection. I don't want to spend forever on this. Um, but yeah, kind of cool. Um, I know you all had mentioned like cold and wet weather in LA is somewhat of an unusual thing, but at least back in the mid nineties, um, LA had a program specifically for homeless shelters during cold or wet weather, um, which we know that because these programs were done for people in those shelters. Um, so let's see, what was the next uh, one that <coughs> was requested? Let me see. Um, NEA Theater 98.99. Ah, so this is the Lollapalooza one. Uh, box four, folders nine and ten. I have so many places to set things now that I'm losing where I put things. <laughs> That's not, not ideal, but... Uh, box four. Largely for El Nino season in Southern California. Ah, okay. See, I... I have been to Southern California, but only when I was like... Maybe, geez, how old was I? Like five? I don't math well, but some, like, the last time I was in California, well, okay, the last time I was in California was 2016. But um, prior to that, the last time I was in California, and, and that was for a conference, but the last time I was in California prior to that was, um, in 1986. Uh, so, um, and I was there, we were moving from Hawaii uh, to Virginia. And um, we were waiting in California for the car to come over from Hawaii. So we were there for maybe like two weeks while they shipped the car. And then we drove across country. Um, uh, folders nine and 10. So I don't know, I definitely at that age, I wasn't paying attention to things like El Nino. Uh, <laughs> All right. Hang on. I knocked over my water bottle. So now I'm gonna take a sip from it because I've been talking for at least a half an hour. Okay. Two folders here on this um, NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, um, Lollapalooza item, <clears throat> I believe was the, um, or no, this, is, this says 96, but that definitely says 98.99. These, um, Certified mail receipts uh, from items that were sent to the National Endowment for the Arts are from 96, though. Grants Office, National Endowment for the Arts, 96 again. So that is saying to me, and we'll find out for sure as we move through these materials, but that's saying to me that they started applying for stuff related to the Lollapalooza Festival in 96. 
and it's in this folder of stuff from 98.99, so like two years in advance. Um, Executive Office of the President, Office of Management and Budget, Washington, D.C., September 29th, 1995. So, like, <laughs> three years in advance. Uh, two, the heads of executive departments and establishments cost principles uh, for nonprofit organizations. Um, so, changes in stuff. Policies regarding nonprofit organizations. Needs justification for the acquisition of a facility. So, this would have been important information for them, it looks like, in probably applying for grants so that they could do their programs. <laughs> Copy of the Federal Register from Wednesday, June 22nd, 1988. Um, if you're not familiar with the Federal Register, uh, essentially it is a printed document that the um, uh, Printer General for the United States uh, puts out following every day's congressional proceedings. And it is a detailed summary of everything that happened that day in Congress. Um, I wasn't necessarily expecting um, <clears throat> lots of federal policy upon opening this, this folder. Uh, we have a NEA grant financial status report, short form. Uh, so this would have been a form that they probably needed to turn in once they were granted funds. Let's see. All that stuff was like in here before. <clears throat> NEA Theater Artifacts. This, I'm double checking the folder. It does say that this is the Lollapalooza folder. <clears throat> Which, honestly, this happens. It is entirely possible that everything prior to this point was in this folder when it came to us. It might not make logical sense for it to be there it is entirely possible it was misfiled by the people who used these files. But if it was misfiled by them and came to us misfiled, we are never going to move it from where it was misfiled. Uh, because part of accepted archival practice for documents is to maintain existing order. Um, so if something was misfiled and was in the wrong spot when it was sent to us, it stays in that wrong spot forever. Uh, okay, so we have uh, an item here from April 22nd, 1999, um, to the Grants and Contracts Office of the National Endowment of the Arts. Dear sirs and ladies, please accept the following documents from the Los Angeles Poverty Department. One, geographic location of project activity form. One, request for advance of reimbursement form. Three, final descriptive report forms, 12 pages. And one, final status report form. If you need any further information or hard copies, get in touch. Final descriptive report. This should hopefully be something um, maybe describing some programming that they did. Um, we'll, we'll find out. The Los Angeles Poverty Department used this grant. Yes, this is this is the kind of summary that it, that is great to see on on these types of um, grant applications. The the final report of what did you do with the money? Um, used this grant from the NEA to support the creation of a new play, Artifacts. Conceptually, the project was born from the intricate relation between objects and personal memory. The idea behind the project was to explore how objects could trigger memories, which in turn could be used to trace back events of one's life. Many members of the Los Angeles Poverty Department are or have lived in disadvantaged situations. Um, and I realize I should really zoom in a little bit so that you all can see these words just a little bit closer. 
This project was especially poignant for this cast because many are still searching to make sense of the events generally caused by both chance and choice, which led to their disadvantaged situations. The artistic process focused on the objects, clothes, watches, toys, bottles, that were present in times of great transition in people's lives. The exploration focused on whether the objects could bring people back to the moment a certain path was taken rather than another, and how this may have dramatically altered their life. Furthermore, could this internal search reveal information about how a path was taken rather than another, and how this may have dramatically altered one's life? So the idea was that these objects could not only be a roadmap to one's past, but also a tool to understand more about oneself. Through a series of theatrical and movement in improvisational exercises, the cast was encouraged to explore and reflect about these objects in their personal lives. The different stories were then meshed together in further improvisations. These exercises stressed that each member consider everyone else's stories while being involved in their own. This process was explored and then polished until it was honed to a coherent whole, which resulted in the original performance, Artifact. An interesting aspect of the process was that the performers slash creators embarked on a sort of individual journey in their own past, attempting to deal with painful memories and more basically attempting to simply understand life. These individual journeys had many common elements and many universal themes, such as loss, so that in the end anyone could relate to the themes of the performance. For instance, LAPD performer Friend uh, Francisco Uribe, uh, who recently turned 80, recounted in a telling moment of the show how he lost his parents at the age of 12, but that he knew he would be reunited with them soon. In the show, the parents then came back to life, which symbolized a personal renewal or rebirth after the long search through one's memories. In the end, it seemed all the different journeys melted and became one journey, that of a search for personal harmony. The show was performed at the Cortland Hotel, located at 520 South uh, Wall Street, Los Angeles, California, on March 27, 1999, at 8 p.m., in conjunction with another LAPD performance. The venue is located in the area of downtown Los Angeles, known as Skid Row. There was an audience of approximately 70 people, 90% of which came from the area. The audience reacted warmly to the performance. A few later expressed interest in joining the next LAPD production. The principal artists in this project were the seven LAPD performers, all of which live or have lived in the Skid Row area. The show was directed by LAPD's assistant artistic director and longtime member David Helenda. Partnering organizations include SRO Housing Corporation, who owns the venue where the performance took place. Uh, LAPD has been partnering for a long time with SRO. Many LAPD performers live in the SRO hotels. LAPD regularly performs shows and mini-shows and lead workshops at various SRO hotels. In addition, the rehearsals took place in an SRO hotel. LAPD's partnership with SRO has been mutually beneficial to further the organization's mutual goal of improving downtown Los Angeles's quality of life. LAPD activities provide important and rare cultural resources in the area, which is paramount for SRO to build a safe and enjoyable community. While SRO assists LAPD in producing their events and reaching out into the community, uh, other organizations involved include St. Vincent Cardinal Manning, a shelter where LAPD holds some of its activities, and the VOA, a drug rehabilitation program where LAPD leads performance workshops. Both these organizations sent some of their residents to attend the performance. This grant helped LAPD in creating this performance and is, and is grateful to the NEA. Without this financial assistance, this production could not have been possible. This project helped, as mentioned above, provide rare cultural resources in an impoverished neighborhood. These performances and per participating in LAPD provide a forum where people can create art, express themselves, set goals such as committing to rehearsals, and engender hope where it is needed. 
this project helped further the mission of LAPD, which is that art ought to be accessible and created by all, who, uh, by all those who wish, not just a select few. The only significant problem is the decreasing financial support LAPD has been receiving as evident in this production. All our funders have lowered their support recently, including the NEA. As a result, this show, though quite successful, was only performed once. This impairs LAPD's ability to reach out and include more people and more deeply. Yet the increasing violence nationally and internationally is an important sign that this type of dialogue needs to be expanded and needs to be more inclusive. I love how they ended the description. They talk about um, what the show was, why it was meaningful, why it uh, sort of provided an outlet for artistic expression and universal meaning and um, why it was especially meaningful for the community that they serve, um, how the money was beneficial, uh, the type of organizational partnerships they had. And then they point out that they can only do this work with financial support from uh, sponsors such as the NEA and that support has been going away. And um, like first they make the case for like, we did great things with your money but we could have done more. And I, I love that they ended with that because they are an advocacy organization in addition to being a theatrical organization. Uh, and so that seems perfectly, perfectly in line with what they should have been doing. Um, another copy of the same report. see what else we have. Um, oh, looks like we have a um, template for this report uh, so they could make multiple copies, I guess. Honestly, um, in archival processing, depending on the level of processing, uh, a lot of these copies would not be retained normally uh, because if you've got multiple identical copies, of the same document with no like additional handwriting or altered text or things like that, if they are identical, uh, where it's clear like there's just like 20 copies of something, um, generally at most two or three copies is all that will get kept. Um, let's see what else. I haven't found mention of Lollapalooza yet. Uh, it's in the folder, or it's on the folder name, so I'm, I'm skipping ahead because it mentions um, NEA, which we've definitely had National Endowment for the Arts stuff, but I haven't found the part about Lollapalooza yet. Um, more National Endowment for the Arts. Arts, work sample index, application checklist. Representative list of performances. Information about people. Maybe the second folder has the Lollapalooza stuff. Um, and they're just organized that way because they were organized that way in the files that came to us. Anyone else thinking about that bit of Wayne's World where they are starting that concert? Oh gosh, I vaguely remember bits of Wayne's World and sadly that is not the part that sticks with me. So I'm not certain. Uh, exactly which part you're referring to. Um, more National Endowment for the Arts. Lollapalooza! Yeah, uh, they are apparently just, there's multiple National Endowment for the Arts items. And then, for some reason, Lollapalooza is just included with it. Um, it looks like just a couple of pages here on Lollapalooza. 
they go to an office thing to get forms. Oh, okay, so forms for the concerts. Um, so, the Lollapalooza Fund. I'm actually going to move the folder out of the way, and we'll, we'll just look at the documents. Uh, final report. Your final report includes a completed financial and narrative report. Generally, organizations will not be considered for future fundraising funding unless we have a final report of some kind on file. Okay, um, that makes sense. That's typically how uh, funding organizations, they want to know what did you do with the money. Um, oh, <laughs> Portico, thank you for the hydrate reminder. I will, I will have some water. Please complete this and the attached financial and narrative reports by the due date indicated below and return to the Lollapalooza Fund, uh, Santa Monica, California. Report due date, January 15th, 1998? 99? I'm uncertain. Um, I think they wrote eight and it was supposed to be nine because January. Uh, the Lollapalooza Fund Final Report Narrative. Um, oh, this is saying what needs to be in the report. Uh, it consists of brief answers to questions one through five. So describe the project set forth. Describe the results of the project. Describe the future of your project. How did the Lollapalooza Fund grant make a difference for your organization? Is there anything else you want us to know? This is interesting because, like, I'm familiar with, like, Lollapalooza somewhat generally. I, I definitely have never attended, like, Lollapalooza. Um, I didn't realize, like, there was such a thing as the Lollapalooza Fund that was a grant-issuing organization. I've never heard of this. Um, July 8th, 1998, uh, to Sonia Mims the Los at the Los Angeles Poverty Department. Dear, Ms. Mi Dear Mrs. Mims, um, interesting, I wonder if, do they know? I mean, I presume that maybe they know that Sonia is married and uses MRS as opposed to like Ms. I don't know, I think it's presumptuous to just write it unless you like have a personal relationship. Um, at the time, though, this would have been 98. Uh, it was probably considered just like a general sign of respect to um, an adult woman to put misses whether or not they were married. Um, yes, they were using an AOL email for the fund in 1998. Um, you have to remember, this is 1998. The major... Uh, ways to get on the internet were AOL and um, bulletin board systems and uh, I can't think there's, there was a competitor to AOL, Prodigy. It was AOL, Prodigy and bulletin board systems. And that was how you got online. And then uh, within a couple of years of 98, Earthlink uh, became a way that people got online. Um, but like AOL was like the major thing that people were aware of. Um, I think there was another one that started with a C and I can't remember the name. It, my, my brain is telling me that there was a, a similar thing to AOL that started with a C and I just can't remember what it was. Um, but, like, anybody who was, like, high school or college age or older at the end of the 90s remembers just the absolute landfills worth of AOL uh, CDs that would just arrive at your door in your mailbox uh, they were given away for free at every event you went to with a, the, the AOL CD with the organization's logo on it because 
I mean, they made so many CDs, and they were all to get people to sign up for AOL. Um, and it wasn't just that you, you went online and then you went to AOL. AOL was how you got online. AOL controlled your computer's router, or not router, modem, uh, controlled your computer's router, told it how to dial into one of the AOL centers, establish a connection, and then you accessed the internet through America Online. Um, it was like curated internet. Uh, you had news, you had chat rooms, you had email. Um, and I mean, even to the point where there is a movie uh, titled, You've Got, uh, was it? Yeah, there, there is a movie, You've Got Mail. Uh, that the title is like inspired by the, at the time, ubiquitous You've Got Mail sound clip that would play when you signed on to AOL if you had unread email messages. So, the CDs that were everywhere. Yeah, CompuServe. Uh, so, CompuSA was a store that sold computers. CompuServe uh, was a competitor for providing access to the internet. That was the, the one that started, but mainly it was AOL and Prodigy that were trying to take the market that previously had been private bulletin board systems or uh, things like that in order to, uh, like, I had a friend in high school that had a tower PC in his basement that was just always on and um, it was a bulletin board system, and we would dial into his computer in his basement uh, to connect to chat rooms that we chatted in with other friends. Um, and that was the internet for us before AOL came along. So seeing an AOL address on a document from 98 just means that like, that's like having a Gmail address today. Um, used AOL Instant Messenger for years and only stopped because it was shut down. Chat rooms, yeah, internet chat rooms. Um, anyway, I'm going to actually read the, the document. Um, I am pleased to enclose our grant check for $5,000 to the Los Angeles Poverty Department. This is a general support grant. Can anybody... Um, Give me a, uh, an inflation conversion for $5,000 in 98 funds uh, to today. Um, please have an officer, director, or trustee sign both copies of the enclosed grant agreement and return the original copy to our office. A brief report on the use of the funds will be due January 15th, 1999. I have enclosed the report form for your convenience. Please do not spend too much time on this report. Our goal is to find out how the Los Angeles Poverty Department is progressing and how the grant is being used. I sincerely apologize for the length of time it has taken for us to get this check to you and for any confusion or problems that may have arisen in the pr process. Unfortunately, our initial attempt to get this to you in March was not successful. The Lollapalooza Fund is a great supporter of the Los Angeles Poverty Department and is honored to support your important work. Uh, the Lollapalooza Fund is committed to helping grow healthy communities and are therefore particularly interested in organizations that, quote, teach people how to fish, not those that hand out, quote, fish for a day. We are committed to supporting organizations which, in other words, increase underserved communities' access to resources that empower people and that expand opportunities and minds. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, signed, a uh, Amy Weinberg, Executive Director. Google says that uh, $5,000 in 1998 funds would be equivalent to $9,089.29 today. Yeah, chat rooms were interesting. I was I was in high school um, when chat rooms were a thing.
Uh, now we have uh, another letter from the Lollapalooza Fund to John Malpede. Um, Mr. Malpede, uh, I'm pleased to enclose a grant check for $5,000, general support grant. Uh, same, same letter. Um, so that's July. This was July. Interesting. So it looks like they got two grants of five thousand uh, dollars, and one what, one check was sent to um, Sonia Mims, and the other to John Malpede. Because um, these letters are both dated the same day, unless these letters both came with the check, I'm uncertain. That is that is interesting to me. Um, I'm curious as to whether they got two grants directed by two different people within the organization or whether it was just one grant and for some reason had two letters. Um, on July 9th, 1998, the Lollapalooza Fund, fund uh, awarded a grant to the Los Angeles Poverty Department in the amount of 5,000 um, general support. It gives the terms of what that means. Use the grant solely for the purposes stated above. Uh, shall repay to grantor any portion which is not used. Uh, submit a report within six months. Not earmarked to be used in any attempt to influence legislation. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, so these are the terms and conditions of the grant. What I wish we had, and what it doesn't seem like we do have, is... Um, copies of the reporting back to Lollapalooza uh, about what was done with it because that seems to be all that we have. Let me look at the finding aid and see if maybe there's more Lollapalooza related stuff. Nope, those are the only two folders that mention Lollapalooza. So, so I don't know specifically what they did with the Lollapalooza funds. Um, Hmm. Well, before we move on to something else, I would like to um, maybe share some um, clips of LAPD performances. I have three video clips. These would have been promotional videos um, because they were all uh, between like three and ten minutes long. Um, so that is, I'm gonna try and make this work. Uh, we've, we've done this before, but it's been a long time since I shared media of this type on stream. Um, so gonna try. And hopefully I have uh, a working chat uh, that I can watch. While I do this, let me switch to, uh, yeah, switch to this one, crossed fingers. Yes, it's displaying the right things, except I need to pause the music before I do this. Now, let me try that again. Okay, but like, my phone is still giving me the chat from like way back when we were talking about El Nino. Uh, try and get the current chat, please. Somebody say something so that I know that you're chatting or so that I know I have up-to-date chat. Not, I mean, I'm whatever. All right, so this first one is um, a clip from a March 2000 performance of a show called Red Beard, Red Beard, which um, is something that I believe they still do annually to this day. 
uh, I believe I saw this on their website uh, it, among the list of um, shows that they still do. And it is a performance, um, <clears throat> like a live, from what I could tell uh, from the clip and from description, um, it's like a live performance slash translation of Akira. Maybe you all will know more. Uh, I can also try and visit the um, LAPD website because there's a description. That, actually, let me do that. Yeah, let me do that real quick and, and we'll see. Uh, Because I know it mentioned on their website what it was. Yay, Shadows and Crafty Becky. I see the chats, so good. Um, all right, under projects on their website, I remember seeing this one listed. Uh, I wonder if I can search. Never mind. I'm just going to find it. Recurring project. Let's see. Redbeard, Redbeard. Ha ha. I knew I had seen it here. Um, maybe? Okay, Project History. Uh, directed by John Malpede. The production is a duet for the Akira Kurosawa film Red Beard and live performers. The 1965 film's harsh depiction of the dynamics of extreme poverty resonates today in urban America. The film and the performance explore the question how to reverse the cycle of hurt and victimization. The film makes me think of uh, Simone Weil, uh, says Malpede, who wrote a one-line history of the world when she said something like, when my migraines were raging, I wanted to punch someone else in the head just to let them know how I was feeling. In Redbeard, Kurosawa envisions a dynamic in which degradation is transformed into something positive rather than becoming frozen as bitterness. LAPD performers comprise one or more multiple casts that perform simultaneously, simultaneously for intimate audiences. The film is shown in Japanese without subtitles on a 32-inch television and the players sit in on either side and perform the text oratorio style. Often they enact scenes in counterpoint to the film and at other points they perform as a chorus and use gesture to foreshadow, refer back to, and otherwise amplify emotionally significant moments. Uh, initially, the production had one cast and was performed at the Cortland Hotel on Skid Row. In 2008, Theater 2 uh, Genevilliers invited LAPD to create the performance for its opening year with four casts of ten performers, each performing simultaneously for intimate audiences, with three casts performing in French and one in English. In 2015, LA, uh, uh, LA Poverty Department uh, celebrated its 30-year anniversary by recasting Redbeard Redbeard with two casts in honor of Highway's 25th anniversary. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of background about um, the clip that we are about to see. And um, hopefully the sound comes through okay. If there are any problems, let me know. Ever done for the poor? Has a law ever been passed to get rid of poverty and ignorance? 
The problem is much deeper than that. There's always some story of great sadness and misfortune behind illness. This Rokosuke, for example. A craftsman. A gold lacquer or some note. It is brought in from a cheap inn. He has no visitors. He won't talk. He won't answer any questions. He hasn't said a word. He hasn't even said it hurts. His stomach cancer is probably nothing compared to the pain his heart feels. A girl's been hurt at a building site. She's too much for me. She fell. She's in the operating room. There's nothing so solemn as a man's last moments. Watch him. Carefully. <laughs> so that was the, um, uh, short three-minute promotional clip that was on, on VHS in the collection. Um, the next video that I have is, um, huh, I went shorthand on this one. Uh, hang on one second. I have to pull up the um, actual, like, full title. Because uh, in my naming the file, I went shorthand. Um, this is a clip from a, uh, let's see, 1993 production uh, entitled Give Up All Your Possessions and Follow Me. Um, I don't know anything about it beyond what is in the clip. Um, I did not see this listed on their listing of uh, like current sort of works that they, they still perform. So, um, I suspect that this is one that they no longer do. Um, but it, it was a good clip. Uh, our, our digitization technology digitizes in real time. So they were a few minutes long. I needed to be there to start the next one. So I sat there and like watched them while I was uh, digitizing them. Um, so I've seen them at least once. This one is about 10 minutes long. Uh, we definitely have time for that. And then I believe the one after that is six minutes long. And then I do want to show some of the large format items and pull out some flyers. But if there is uh, anything else specifically that you see on the finding aid that you want me to get to, uh, be sure to put it in chat. Um, and I will make it a priority to get to that in the roughly half hour that we have left today. Okay, let's do the stunt double scene then. 
now. Otis, come on. Are you ready? Come on. Explain to them who I am. Yes, yes. They know Otis doesn't know who you are. Come on, let's do it. I'm Otis Otis. Nobody touches me. You got that? No. no. Hi, Kaden. Welcome. Treating Thank you like for nothing. the raid. Beating me, kicking me, abusing me. And I look just like Jay Leno. I'm a stud double. I think we'll actually um, stop that one there just because this one's a, a sort of a longer clip. Um, but that gives you a sense of sort of um, that show at least from what I could tell from the like 10 minutes of, of clip that I have, um, give up all your possessions and follow me. Um, and it's clear that the production was, they were acting out the creation of a movie. Um, and there was one of the, so when you get layers of actors playing actors in a production, um, it gets a little confusing about how to describe, but um, the uh, one of the characters being portrayed, uh, like he was playing an actor who was playing a part. And so uh, during the filming, um, his character's personal issues uh, were disrupting the filming process. He had some issues with being touched and um, w appeared to be having some potential uh, mental health issues. Um, and I think they did an excellent job of, of portraying that and the, um, the emotional content was there. Uh, it, it, I, I thought, um, that that clip gives sort of a sense of like the level of acting talent uh, because he did an amazing job uh, of portraying sort of the the issues that that character was going through um, the last one that i have is a uh, a clip here from a production so this is from a performance called Brothers uh, from a program titled LAPD Inspects Washington. So they had a whole series of these LAPD Inspects. And so there's LAPD Inspects, uh, I think Los Angeles, um, Inspects Washington, Inspects uh, Twin Cities, 
possibly like Chicago, Sacramento, Seattle. I don't remember all of the places. I know uh, for sure Twin Cities and, and Washington because they stuck in my head. Uh, the Finding Aid lists them. Um, and so I think this was like the, some of their traveling and, and performing. Um, and so this is a clip from a production as part of LAPD Inspects Washington. Um, and that production is titled Brothers. And this clip is from July of 1990. Um, and sadly, I do not have captions uh, for, for these. I, I managed to digitize them, but I have not had time to caption them. Um, about you too. I said, nah, he probably in college. That can't be the truth. That can't be the truth. Tell me it's not the truth. All right? No, you can't tell me. You can't tell me nothing. I'm seeing it with my own eyes, man. With my own eyes. I'm seeing it, man, with my own eyes, man. Fucking disgrace, man. Damn, damn, man. God. Fuck up, man. What you gonna do with yourself, huh? What you gonna do with yourself now, huh? Why don't you just get you a Greyhound ticket? Cause I'm through with you, man. I'm finished with you. That's it. Watch your scold I'm gone, man. Watch your sleep. Fuck it, man. Don't talk back to me, man. What's up with that shit? I told you about that shit. Don't talk back to me. Don't start that wimp shit either. What do you want? What do I want, huh? You want me to hit you? What do I want? Is that it? You hit me, oh, man. You a dead down motherfucker. The violet, huh? You a dead motherfucker. Yeah, huh? Go nah, ahead. You might as well beat this bitch, because that's all you do, beat bitches. Up, that's right? what I like that's to do. That's what you into, huh? That's what I like to Where do. You take your ass. I'm out of here. Take your sorry, good for nothing, black sorry ass out of here, lizard. You crawl it to us. You love talking that shit, huh? You talking big game, oh, man. But you ain't got nothing. You a big game. Where's your where's your where's your dynasty at? Where's your empire? Where's your franchise? Where's your corporation? Where's your enterprise? Oh no, he's not an entrepreneur. He's a transient. The fuck you gonna do now, man? Collect food stamps? Get on disability? You're real sorry. Sell bus tickets? You're real sorry, just go. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm stay sorry for your part. Just go, man. You can't talk to me like I'm gonna tell you one more thing. I'm gonna tell you I love you, man. I fucking love you, man. You just go, why don't you just go? Don't worry about that. Why don't you just go? No, why don't you just go? You go. You a badass? You a badass? Now who's a badass? Huh? Oh, you go. You go, badass. Yo. You go. You go, badass. Just go. No, I ain't got to go nowhere. Let's go. 
I ain't got to go nowhere. So you go. No, you go. You go. Fuck that. That ain't nothing. That ain't shit what you do. That ain't nothing. If I eat motherfuckers like you, that ain't nothing what you do. Fuck that shit. Pussy ass. Just go. You go. Just go. Fuck you, man. Just go. You ain't shit. Just go. You ain't shit. That shit you ain't doing ain't nothing. All right, so uh, what did you all think of the, um, the clips? Uh, a chance to actually get to see um, some of the actual like theatrical work uh, of this performance slash community um, advocacy organization. Yeah, they were very intense um, performances. And, and I think that stems from the fact that, so from what, uh, from what I've learned about the organization, um, they, they worked with like the Skid Row community quite regularly. Uh, and oftentimes the performances themselves are improvised works where the, so it, it's sort of the community programming that they're doing is um, inviting the residents from the Skid Row area to come in and take part in the creation of a theatrical work that represents their lives. So um, that includes the home, homeless populations, the, the people who are significantly um, uh, in sort of uh, less good financial positions, um, who are involved in the creation of these works. And so they become more polished works of, of theater uh, but they start off as an improv improvisation. And so they're pulling from some deep, deep uh, sort of emotional centers um, from the lives of people who have not had it easy. So it's not, not especially surprising to me that they are um, intense works. So uh, what I have here, these are from the oversized folder. And I'm gonna need to zoom out for this. I don't know how far I need to zoom out. That's the thing. Uh, a little further. I think you're probably gonna see the computers. Um, and I, I don't know exactly what these are. And the oversized folder could be from any of the portions of the collection because items will be taken out of, say, another area. They may have been part of something else. And they're put in here just specifically because they are big. Um, hi, Leon Doodles. <laughs> Welcome in. Thank you for the raid. And Caden, once again, thank you uh, for the raid earlier. Welcome, everybody. We are um, 
doing my Wednesday show, which is called Archival Adventures. I stream this both to the Virginia Tech uh, University Libraries Twitch channel, uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, as well as my own um, Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, and that's why I'm, I've got two computers so that I can like follow both chats. Um, and today we're looking, so Wednesdays I, I look at um, archival materials from the Special Collections and University Archives here at Virginia Tech. And today's collection is the Los Angeles Poverty Department collection. Um, this is a collection of materials from a uh, theater and community advocacy organization that started um, 1985 and is still active today. These materials cover 85 through 2000. So it's good to see you, Leon Doodles. Thank you for joining. And I'm going to uh, type one handed. Um, so, oh, Portico got it for me. Um, there is a link for the, uh, the finding aid um, so that you can. Uh, take a look at the description of the collection if there is a, a folder listed under the containers list that you uh, might like to see let me know and I can um, try and make sure that we get to it on stream uh, just gonna drop that link in the other chat just in case because I don't know who's here and which side they're on um, so right now I have the oversized folder um, which so there's not a specific topic for the oversized folder. Uh, it's just big things. Um, why there is an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper in the oversized folder, I don't know. But I have a I have a feeling that for this collection, I'm guessing the oversized folder may just be uh, items related to this monologues from LAPD inspects America, Chicago, Philadelphia, and San Diego. I'm going to do a quick little search on the finding aid and see if I can understand a little bit more. Uh, yep, nope, it's just oversized materials. So yeah, uh, it, this is gonna just be whatever at this point. Um, which this is not the best way to do it. The way that it is on this finding aid is not the best way to describe oversized materials. Yes, the oversized folder contains oversized, oversized materials, but it should list, um, so there should be a, a listing somewhere of uh, LAPD inspects America, Chicago, Philly, San Diego. Uh, this came from somewhere and it should just list on there for containers. It should be like folder or box seven, folder 26 and oversized folder one. Um, because we lose context by not doing that and by just saying oversized materials are in oversized f folder. Well, but now I don't know what all these things are. Um, so we're not perfect. <laughs> um, and I, do, I don't think you'll find any archives that has done everything absolutely perfectly. So uh, what we have here is um, interesting. It looks like they, I'm gonna zoom in and then we can talk photo production of, of what it appears that this is. But I'm going to zoom in so that you can see like the photos themselves. Um, this is a photograph of photographic negatives that has then been cut up and turned into like a film strip if that makes sense. So what you can see, like here, this one in the center, I think I've centered it. We'll find out. Um, I did not get it where I thought I had. Maybe? There's a delay. Um, oh no, I did and you can't, you can't really see it. 
Uh, let me see if I can show another one that, because it doesn't show up on the monitor very well. That's the thing. Okay, you can sort of see it on this one. I can try zooming in even further and see if it shows up any better at a closer zoom. Yeah, no, it just doesn't show. It's really subtle. Um, but so this, this photo here, you have um, the picture itself, but then up above it where that 9049 is, there's actually like the little outline of um, like, if you were playing a film on a reel-to-reel -reel projector, it's the little bit on the side of that that's this series of like holes that feeds the film through. Um, and so this is like film strip that has been photographed and then cut up into these pieces. Um, Not certain, there's no label on it, so I don't know exactly what it is, but it, it's got arrows sort of, I guess, telling a story that you would follow sort of like a storyboard. I'm, I'm not certain. Um, and without some documents or context to go with it, I, I don't know that anybody will ever know. Um, but it is interesting to look at. And maybe with a little bit of study, I might be able to figure out what it was, uh, but we definitely don't have time for that level of uh, analysis on stream because we've only got about 15 minutes left. Um, so we have a series of like poster board type things here. Um, So we've got text from some from a, a production, it looks like, laid out. This probably would have been for a display somewhere. There's tape on the back, so it was definitely taped up onto something. Again, I would love to have context to just know, um, like have a better sense of exactly where these things came from. We do have some posters, which I love. Um, I love when places that have done events or productions of things include their posters in their records. Uh, and I love when event posters include the full date. <laughs> um, this, is, this is me once again saying, um, whoops, I zoomed too far in. Um, I mean, I have said that many times, but that was not what I meant to finish that sentence. This is me once again saying, please include the year when you put dates on things. Please, please include the year. Uh, so this is Los Angeles Poverty Department presents Renewed Spirit, directed by uh, David Helenda. Um, I don't know if it's just my uh, TV monitor that I can see this on or if it's also in the stream, um, Helenda's name uh, kind of gets, blends into the background there. It does not blend in that way in person. Um, you can see their gradations and this, uh, like the guy's coat is much more gray than black. So the words stand out better. I don't know if that's, this is a brand new camera. Maybe we need to do some adjusting so it can pick out the grays from the blacks a little better, but also it might just be that it, it's a camcorder and it, it's not capable of doing that. I don't know. Uh, but this production, uh, let's see, October 23rd, 1998, 7 p.m. at the Cortland Hotel. Um, and we have a, a photo of the cast there uh, as part of that poster. And so uh, you can see the people that were involved in that production in 98. Um, we have the L.A. Poverty Department Presents Race, uh, written and directed by Pascal Rambert, or Pascal Rambert. Uncertain. 
Uh, quote, race is a love poem suggesting the ache of what might have been if the West had embraced rather than exploited others, uh, unquote, from Susan Mason. Co-production of Los Angeles Poverty Department, California State University, Los Angeles Poverty Department, uh, or sorry, co-production of Los Angeles Poverty Department, California State University, Los Angeles, Department of Theater, Arts, and Dance. Communication Studies and Modern Languages and Literatures, uh, French Cultural Services in the United States, French Consulate in Los Angeles, French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, through Association Francaise d'Archon Astique, Astique, uh, uh, I'm not certain, certain. It's been, like I, I've said before on stream, I haven't taken French since like eighth grade. Um, like, it's been a long time. Uh, City of Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Department, Arco Foundation, Side One, Postume the Theatre. Uh, so a lot of people involved there, and based on the French, fact that the French consulate was involved, I'm guessing it's Pascal Rambert, the way that I pronounced it originally. Uh, <laughs> the next poster we have here is L.A. Poverty Department. Uh, La, let's see, La Boca presents a collaborative evening of performance and gestural theater with transitional homeless performers. Um, Sarah Elgart with Madres, uh, La Boca at the Sunshine Mission, Casa de Rosas, uh, December 13th and December 14th, 15th. Sadly, we do not know what year. Um, special reception benefiting La Boca, a new multidisciplinary performance space at the Sunshine Mission, a shelter and single room occupancy theater, or sorry, occupancy hotel for homeless women. Um, So with a little research, we could probably figure out what year. And also the documentation elsewhere in the collection might give us that information. We have the National Homeless Week, Los Angeles Poverty Department, uh, Thursday, January 18, 1990, in University Park from 12 to, to 1, in conjunction with the Human Corps Volunteer Fair. Uh, let's see some quotes, some of the nation's most exciting experimental theater from Art Coast. This is raw theater from San Francisco Examiner, which I think the clips we saw earlier would definitely confirm this is raw theater. Uh, everyone should see it from LA Weekly. LAPD is alive and angry, smart and not about to be patronized by Art Week. Uh, so the Human Corps Volunteer Center, ASI Programming, um, and so this was, it looks like a poster that was approved to be posted at, um, Cal State Polytechnic University. Yeah, Cal State Polytechnic University. Um, I don't know the year because the approval stamp doesn't have a year on it, but this stamp was so they could post it at that university. Um, and they have used the same picture. Okay, so this picture is the picture that I used for the promotional uh, graphic. It'll be like the picture that is on the like slide that becomes the still image on the Twitch highlight and on YouTube. Um, so it is the picture that I had picked and used for my tweet. And then I discovered this picture, it's on this poster. This picture is on their website. Like, apparently everybody sees this picture and they know this is a great picture for promoting this organization. Um, I don't remember exactly where I grabbed it from. I may try though to find uh, which folder it came from so we can see the actual like unadulterated picture. but. Uh, LA pre per LA per per nope okay I'm gonna try again uh, I'm stumbling over it because 
of just the handwriting was giving me a moment where I thought it was a per hyphen something, but it's no. LAPD performance texts and other texts for lobby Highways Performance Space 1990. If you need me to zoom in on it, do let me know. Uh, right now I'm doing sort of the zoomed out so that you can get a broad scope of the document. But if you want me to zoom in on a specific part, um, you know, just tell me in chat. Um, received from LAPD August 22nd, 2001. Addressed to Gail. Opened June 11th, 2002 by CO. I am uncertain whether this note is, I'm uncertain. There is a chance that this note is a note from the archives, because this would have been around the time that we think we got this. And we had someone named Gail who worked here at the time. So it's possible this note is an internal note to the archives saying when we received it, but I don't know. <laughs> um, Mama Log. So these are just like performance texts. Uh, in poster form. Hi, Johnny. It's Mom. Isn't your machine working? I've been trying to reach you. Didn't you get my messages? Where are you going? Washington? With LAPD? Two weeks? Well, please stay in touch with me. Give me a number where I can reach you. I'm so upset. I'm worried about Eric. He's taking a nap now. Your grandmother is torturing me. I never know what sh I, I never knew she was a sadist. I knew Sissy was her favorite child, but I never knew she was a sadist before. Every time I call her, all she talks about is this person has prostate cancer, and that person has prostate cancer. Tim Clinton, Sissy and Dick's friend, remember him? He used to teach at UWM with, Nick, with Dick, and then his wife moved to Canada. He took a position at the University of Toronto. Well, he's dying of prostate cancer. His condition is terminal, and he's only 60. 20 years younger than Eric. The Canadian government is trying to deport him, send him back to the States. They think he's just there to take advantage of the socialized medicine. It's just terrible. Uh, Nana called me up especially to tell this to me. What is the matter with her? She just can't wait for any opportunity to hurt me. I'm a nervous wreck. What should I do? Should I call her up and tell her I'm sick of her being so sadistic? I don't know. I'm, I'm so upset I can't think straight. That's what I'll do. I'll just tell her it upsets me, and I wish you wouldn't bring up cancers anymore. No, <laughs> I won't call her a sadist. Uh, so when are you going to Washington? Where are you staying? Well, I hope it's someplace decent. Are you going to do a show there? I'm sorry I asked. Why are you doing that? Well, be careful. When I go to the dentist now, they wear gloves and masks. There must be some reason, or they wouldn't do it. And your shows are so rowdy, you could get cut. Why don't you wear gloves in the show? What difference does that make? We're talking about a deadly disease. Isn't it enough for you to work with homeless people? Why do you want to put yourself into such crazy situations? All right, all right. Okay, okay. I don't know. Whatever you want. You know, I've always been supportive of whatever you do. I just saw an article about Anne Magnuson in the entertainment section of the journal. She's in a new comedy series with Jamie Lee Curtis. In the article, it said they were counting on her to breathe life into the show. I'm actually going to pause there because we are very close to the end of stream. But So this is a monologue. And just from reading it, uh, the, the portion that we have read, this would be a monologue um, where it is a person on stage talking into a telephone. So there would be pauses at the places that make sense in the dialogue where she's asked a question and then the next sentence is a response to something that was said in response to the question. So there'd be like, 
um, asking the question, waiting, and then the next line. So there, there are definitely beats and pauses in there that I was not doing just because I don't have time to really perform this, and I was sight reading it for the first time. Um, interestingly, <laughs> discussion of gloves and masks and um, disease, guessing from uh, just context of when this would have been um, in regard to like production of these materials and stuff like that, the date when we got this collection and added it to our materials, um, they likely would have been referring to the uh, AIDS epidemic. Um, although in the context of today, I apologize, uh, I did not know that that was going to come up. Um, So let me just take a quick gander and see if I can locate that photo that I said I was going to look for. And while I do that, I'm just going to show you all this. Um, this is... Well, I'll let you tell me what it is. Um, I really don't remember where I got that photo. Um, I want to say it was like flyers or something like that. Because those are words that I look for when I'm trying to find a graphic to use for promotional purposes for the stream. Uh, possibly box five, folder 26. Oh yeah, definitely in this box. I know because all the folders are backwards in this box as compared to all the other boxes. Um, indeed, it is media key squared. Hi, Fluid Ann. Homepage under About. That's not where I got the photo. But it is indeed on their homepage under About. Um, I got the photo from this collection. But so you can see these are reel-to-reel uh, -reel tapes, um, which would be audio. These are, these are all audio tapes. Um, and then below the audio tapes, we have... VHS tapes, which is uh, like this uh, give up all your possessions and follow me. Um, that's one of the ones that I digitized for a stream today uh, and that we watched a segment of. Um, I have not opened this one. I have not listened to this one. I was very tempted and I think you all know why. It's titled Star Trek. And I have to know if it has anything to do with Star Trek. But I don't know. Um, and then, of course, we also have this. The, the last box here is a small box. And this box is um, more modern cassette audio, audio cassette tapes. Um, so a newer technology than the reel-to-reel, uh, -reel, but still audio. Um, and I did not digitize any of the audio because a lot of it was like um, sort of interviews and things like that, uh, which would have been interesting, but I was looking to digitize more like performance stuff, um, which is why I focused on uh, the video stuff. Um, Bessie's Uptempo. Diverse works, new performance series. So this is supposed to be pamphlets, flyers, and guides. Um, and 
it's a bunch of like magazines, which is not what I was expecting. But I also feel like this is probably the folder that I got that graphic from, but maybe not. All right, so not this one. Uh, I know it's in here somewhere. Fluidan, thank you for the um, sub resubscription. Eight months. Uh, maybe it was in photos. You know, that would make sense if it was like in um, something called photos. Um, no, it was, it was uh, box six folder 12? No, it wasn't. I don't know where it was. Um, this, this is 26, maybe it was. Y'all, I don't know. Ooh, folder 11 maybe. I sort of know what keywords I looked for. Just trying to show you all. I didn't just grab a graphic from their website. I actually just went and like looked in the collection for it. Um, but I may not be able to prove it. Uh, I mean, I could. With, with enough time, I could. Because... Um, it was definitely in here. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is the graphic that I used for, um, this is what I used for the tweet for uh, a graphic on our calendar, um, like our, our events calendar for the library. Um, and this is the graphic that along with like, the title that I gave this episode and um, uh, information like that will become the still image that is on uh, the Twitch highlight and on the YouTube video. Um, so that, it just adds like a, a panel on the left that gives like Archival Adventures and says what it is. But this was the graphic that I found, which, you know, it, it's that photo. And I saw this and I was like, this is great. This is a flyer for a performance. And this is a wonderful image. And it's got the name Los Angeles Poverty Department in performance. And it's uh, LAPD Inspects America, Friday, October 7th, 1988. Uh, so it, it had a lot of elements to it that made it a good, like, promotional to promote the archival collection of documents. Um, and then I found out that this image is one that they have used multiple times. They have this image on their website, on their like about page. They have this image, it was in one of those like large format items in a poster. Uh, like they have used this image multiple times. And um, I think it's partly because, uh, like, this is early. They started in 85. This is from 88. It's got a lot of the founders in the photo. Uh, center is John Malpied, the director, um, uh, like the founder of the organization. So uh, for promotional purposes, it makes a lot of sense as an image. And um, it, so... It had caught my eye and I said, this is a good promotional image. I'm going to use this poster for my promotional stuff. And then I discovered that it was one that they were already using themselves, which I thought was pretty awesome. But I had to show you like where I got it from because I always try to make sure that one of the things we look at during stream is uh, whatever I pulled the image from. Uh, so we got there in the end. There is so much more in this collection. There are boxes full of their grant applications. There are um, various folders about individual productions. There are more of the like promotional videos. There are, like I said, interviews on uh, audio interviews on cassette and reel to reel tapes. Um, so much more stuff here. Um, 
And again, I have no idea why it is here at Virginia Tech, except that there was a period of time in the past where our archives was trying to collect as much theater history stuff as possible, like theater stuff as possible. And I know a number of our collections are of this type where it is theater and activism together. Um, this collection is one I know for sure. We've got one from an alumnus of our program here, um, uh, the Melinda Pittman collection. Uh, and all of her like theater activism work was in uh, like the Portland, Oregon area, but she was a graduate of Virginia, Virginia Tech and so she donated her, her materials here. Um, and I know we, so we have a number of collections of like similar sort of organizations. Um, I think this is a, a, an amazing collection. I would love to see it uh, used by researchers more. Um, I hope that you all have enjoyed uh, visiting this collection with me. Um, and, uh, so that is, that is where we are going to leave off with our exploration for today. Um, and we will be raiding over to another channel here in a moment. Uh, most likely the Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, cause that is where we typically go. Um, what I have coming up next week uh, is I am pulling items from the Henry H. Bauer papers, um, which is a very, very large collection. Um, Bauer, I believe, was uh, faculty here at Tech. Um, and what I have titled the episode, though, is Scientific Unorthodoxies. Uh, the Henry H. Bauer papers. Um, and I will, I thought I was prepared to explain to you all what's coming up next week, uh, but I forgot that this one needed more explanation. So, uh, one moment. The reason it is called scientific unorthodoxies is, um, these papers contain correspondence, grant reports, newspaper clippings, memoirs, class notes, chemistry files, evaluations, appointment books, blah, 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 uh, particularly those pertaining to the Society for Scientific Exploration. Um, notes and comments added by... Uh, much of the material relates to Bauer's work as academic professor and administrator, as well as his interest in the study of anomalies such as the Loch Ness Monster. And indeed, the collection has a lot of stuff about scientific unorthodoxies like the Loch Ness Monster. And so that is what portion of the collection I will be focusing on next week. Completely unplanned, because I selected this weeks ago, months ago at this point. Like, I picked this collection and decided I would do scientific un unorthodoxies, like, probably about two months ago. There's news. I think I saw it first yesterday, but it's definitely out there today, um, that the Loch Ness Monster may have slightly more legitimacy today after the discovery of some fossilized remains. Um, I believe it was fossilized remains, but definitely they have discovered some uh, creature remains. Um, did it switch back to emote only? It better not have. Um, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, so, just completely unexpectedly, apparently the Loch Ness Monster may have more credibility today uh, than when I picked this collection. But um, that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to look at those papers. We're going to look at scientific unorthodoxies uh, through the papers of Henry Bauer. Um, and uh, I know it's the Loch Ness Monster. I think there were others. Uh, we're going to take a look and see 
Um, and so that is what's happening next week. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set up the raid. Uh, do, 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 do. And we will indeed head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, as always, thank you all so much for joining me for Archival Adventures. Uh, we spend two hours with a collection of materials. It is never enough time to look through it all. Um, but I think it is absolutely fun and amazing to, to get to take a peek in these, these items in the archives. I hope that you enjoy the look inside the types of things that are in the archives. I hope it inspires you to learn more about history, possibly the topics that we looked at, um, or to even consider what in your life might be worth archiving, uh, because you definitely have stuff worth archiving. So, um... Thank you all for joining me. Um, we will be heading over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I hope I see you again soon to explore some more history. Bye.